Um, and then uh, in relation to that, Nathan at Humanstein tweeted, the Simpsons didn't predict anything. We just haven't fixed any of America's problems <laughs> since 1989. <laughs> we should probably talk about this. Humanstein contextualize everything. Inauguration Day was an all-time great day for posting on the internet. Bernie's mittens took the world by storm, and people were very, very impressed by the nice coats. And plenty of inaugurating happened as well. One of those was, of course, Kamala Harris, the new Vice President of the United States of America. The VP wore purple, as many in attendance did. Michelle Obama and Hillary Clinton also wore purple to represent unity, between uh, blue and red, the symbolic colors of the U.S.'s major parties. Harris wore a purple dress and a calf-length overcoat with notched lapels, and the internet quickly noted its resemblance to the purple pantsuit that Lisa Simpson donned in the Simpsons episode Bart to the Future from 2000, which set off yet another wave of the Simpsons predicted the future mania all over the internet. Never mind, of course, that Lisa's outfit and appearance in the episode from 2000 was a direct reference to the then First Lady Hillary Clinton's famous pantsuits. Once again, the incredibly thin 9-11 stuff cropped up. Once again, Trump going down the escalator was oohed and awed over uh, as a prediction rather than treated as the reference that it was. Trump went down that escalator in June of 2015 to announce his presidency, and the Simpsons bit with the escalator is a recreation of that moment that they made for a YouTube short in July of 2015. If it were simply a case of people getting a light chuckle over similarities between a long-running sitcom and current events, it wouldn't warrant much criticism. Unfortunately, there are more than a few reasons to be worried about how fervently people share and buy into this kind of meme. The first of which is that The Simpsons Predicted the Future is a gateway to conspiracy theories like predictive programming. I don't have the mental energy to dismantle quote-unquote predictive programming today. It is very fake, and it is very silly. Thankfully, the world's preeminent orange comic strip cat historian Quentin Reviews has already covered this subject in a series of videos, which I'll link in the description below. While it's sort of fair to conceptualize the world as being controlled by a relatively small number of people, those people are just self-interested billionaires buying off politicians and turning local news stations into propaganda mouthpieces. And this, this is, is extremely, extremely dangerous, dangerous to our democracy. democracy. They're not a shadowy cabal dating back to the Enlightenment that is choosing to reveal its dark designs to you via a short-lived spin-off of the X-Files. The New World Order doesn't exist. But if it did, they wouldn't have left clues in the Super Mario Brothers movie from 1993. Also, no matter what they call the secret rulers of the world, they always mean the Jews. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so that I can control some tiny, tiny part of the media. More worrying to me than fringe conspiracy theories like predictive programming is how quickly memes like this can spread misinformation and how that spread reflects on our media literacy and the social media literacy for that matter. A lot of the accuracy of these predictions comes down to willful misrepresentation of fact by people looking to get some easy clout online. See also the ever-changing Today's the Day that Marty traveled to and Back to the Future posts that we had going around on social media for a few years there. Chasing clout with bad memes. Shameful. Having recently gotten some clout on the internet myself, I get it. This dude with like 60,000 followers is dancing to my tweet. It's a devious and destructive way to go about it, but I get it. Nice to meet all 500 of you guys, by the way. Hopefully you'll stick around after this. Patton Oswalt retweeted me. Matilda retweeted me. The Trump going down the escalator bit from July 2015 was a month after Trump went down the escalator in real life, and this was reframed lied about in memes and on social media as having been from Bart to the Future, where the budget crunch from President Trump clip and Lisa's purple pantsuit both originated. A cursory Google search would show that that's not true, but as Jonathan Swift put it in 1710, falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it. However, in all actuality, most of the Simpsons bits that predict the future are merely social criticisms from the time of the episode's creation that are still relevant today. 
that many of us in 2021 look back and see these jokes as prescient or prophetic in some capacity rather than just still relevant might reflect a shortening of our collective memories. We claim to remember the 90s, but do we? It seems as if our cultural memory has been getting shorter and shorter and shorter for a while, but it's not like we've ever been great at accurately recalling the past. Maybe it's the 24-hour news cycle and the relentless doom-scrolling propagated by social media working together to change how we perceive time. Perhaps it reflects a failure to teach younger generations about recent history. Perhaps it's all of the above or something else entirely. There's an entire generation of young adults that were born after 9-11, and there are even more people for whom Trump is the first presidency they can remember in any real capacity. The shortening of our cultural memory may relate to the death of monoculture. Long gone are the days when everyone watched the same shows and movies because there were 20 channels on TV and maybe 200 on cable. I think only boomers are actually watching the news every day. I think everybody else just gets their news piecemeal from the internet. If I'm wrong, go ahead and let me know. <laughs> Everyone's media experience is now so individualized and unique, and there's a constant stream of media being released across hundreds of outlets. That's before even thinking about the massive number of individual content creators served to you based on your taste, like here on YouTube or TikTok's algorithms. In a media landscape this fragmented, unless you go out of your way looking for critiques or even references to recent history, you're not likely to stumble across it. The Simpsons itself is one of the few enduring pieces of the old monoculture that's still ongoing. Coming out at a time when it was actually possible for one piece of media to captivate that large of the viewing public every week for years on end. It was a true cultural behemoth at the height of its popularity. And while not generally an intensely political show, it did find itself in constant conversation with the real world. Much of the enduring pop cultural images of several presidents are rooted in how the Simpsons lampooned them. Regardless of how we got here, the shortness of memory and our susceptibility to media messaging, whether that's capital M media like news outlets or lowercase m media like film and television, is what allows reviled public figures like President George W. Bush to be rehabilitated into lovable painting grandpas that hand out candy and hug liberal talk show hosts. Seriously, why are we calling George W. Bush cute? Jesus fuck. Our inability to reckon with even the recent past and contextualize what we're seeing will continue to haunt us, especially as more and more people get their news, entertainment, and shit posts all in the same place. This sort of public image reshaping as a result of media depictions and our collective forgetfulness also cuts across the aisle. The Joe Biden that just became president is a very different public figure than the one whose 1988 presidential campaign ended in disgrace after his team was caught repeatedly plagiarizing speeches. He's also pretty disconnected from the Joe Biden who made another presidential bid in 2008 that didn't last through the first caucuses and who routinely polled at less than 5% due in part to his support for the Iraq war. Joe Biden's close proximity to the cool president starting in 2008 rehabilitated Biden from the man he was in 2007. That Joe was the guy that supported the Patriot Act and voted for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. His voting record suddenly didn't matter very much to liberals or to casual observers, nor did the fact that Obama picked Biden as a running mate because Biden made the ticket significantly more moderate. The Joe Biden that got elected president wasn't even really the Obama VP. Because of the nature of modern politics and optics, the Joe Biden that became president was like some combination of the Parks and Recreation Joe Biden, famously adored by Leslie Nope, and the aviator sunglasses wearing ice cream cone licking version from the Onion headlines, combined with the worrying trend of liberal fan fiction on Twitter. I'm not suggesting that the American people can't differentiate between fiction and reality. However, there's a great deal of evidence to justify being a little worried that we aren't very good at it as pop culture, current events, and memes converge and the lines between them all get blurrier and blurrier every single day. The very casual rejections of reality and rewriting of history that has allowed George W. Bush or to a much lesser extent Joe Biden to transform their public images aren't dissimilar from the alternative facts of Trump 
or the problem of fake news that in part led to Trump's election. Fake news, too, is a problem of media literacy. Those that tumble down the rabbit hole of QAnon or any of the related deep state conspiracies were susceptible because their media literacy skills weren't up to snuff and they saw one too many ridiculous headlines on their Facebook feed. They couldn't or wouldn't recognize that what they were reading was weapons grade nonsense and as a result they fell for some truly ridiculous shit. Ridiculous shit on the internet, as it turns out, has real-world consequences now. That's not to say that failing to decode decades-old jokes on The Simpsons is equivalent to falling for the QAnon grift, just that these problems come from the same general issue of media literacy. The Simpsons is not prescient or prophetic because it made a joke about an uprising against the police in 1993, not when the murders of Rodney King and the LA riots were a fresh wound from less than a year before. That those kind of references are still relevant shouldn't simply be chuckled at and filed away as The Simpsons predicting the future or calling it. They should be seen as a depressing failure that so little has fundamentally changed since the time of the joke that it actually lands harder today than it did in 93. Throughout pop culture we have this issue with cultural criticism from the past simply being filed away as strangely prescient instead of reckoning with them. V for Vendetta, the comic by Alan Moore and David Lloyd, was not eerily prescient for depicting a future theocratic police state that clamped down on civil liberties and tightly regulated the media. Not when it was written as a blatant critique of Tory policymakers like Margaret Thatcher that were in power in England at the time of its creation in 1982. The elements and emphasis added by the Wachowski sisters, two trans women making their live-action adaptation during the George W. Bush presidency, were equally reflective of real-world problems leading to its 2005 release. Throw a dart at any piece of science fiction from at any point in the last 200 years, and there's a very good chance it's critiquing and thinking about a social problem we're still tackling today that forward-thinking people recognized as a problem in their society then. Politicians and cultural figures like the sentient haircut Josh Hawley love to throw words like Orwellian around, and unless we work to increase our collective understanding of art and history, figures like Orwell will become little more than references made by people that haven't read their work. When 1984 was written in 1948, the year 1984 may have been far-flung, but the fears and concerns that Orwell expressed about nationalism, consolidation of power, censorship, surveillance, and slipping standards of living were not. Orwell's dystopian future is extrapolated from real issues the world was facing following World War II and tracing along the lines of actual history while projecting his awful future. The idea of the three superstates that set the stage for 1984 were drawn directly from the 1943 Tehran Conference when Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt discussed their global areas of influence. The rolling blackouts, bland food, and scarcity of essential goods directly reflected the kind of austerity that World War II Londoners like Orwell himself faced. The perpetual war between those three superstates was a recitation of the then-current belief that World War III was just around the corner. Most of our art is in conversation with the realities of the world, to some degree, and a great deal of it is made with the high-minded ideal that it might change the world. I believe that fiction and cultural criticism can indeed change the world because they can impact human hearts. You have to be able to decode those messages, though, and that requires vigilance and a willingness to tackle uncomfortable truths. Propagandists and pundits that are happiest when the status quo isn't challenged also believe in the power of art and media. The Pentagon wouldn't spend millions of dollars every year to be positively featured in major motion pictures if they didn't. That means that it's in all of our best interest to learn how to engage with capital M media and lowercase m media messages before Orwell's newspeak becomes the dominant language our media in our world can be understood in. Thank you folks so much for watching, and to all my new subscribers, hello! I'll be working on a 500 subscriber Q&A special, so keep an eye out for that here or over on Twitter where you can find me, at Humanstein. Thank you so much. Humanstein. Contextualize everything.